audience know that the national security challenges that we deal with today, they're not security challenges that are contained to a specific state, nation state, or for that matter, even a region anymore. These challenges that we face are global challenges. And to get after these global challenges, it's going to take global partnerships. So I first want to highlight today another thank you, and that's to our air attachés that are here. We have 13 countries represented here. If you can stand up, our air attachés from the 13 countries. <laughs> so thank you for being here. And I also, when I talk about these partnerships, Partnerships are bigger than these government-to-government -government international partnerships. When I talk to par about partnerships, I talk about partnerships as our industry also. So I want to do a shout out also to our industry partners here today because our coalition is effective because of the best weapon systems in the world that you're providing and providing interoperability for our coalition. So thank you also to our industry partners. So now, if you'll allow me, I'm going to introduce uh, each of our panel members here. Um, to my immediate left, to your right, is Major General Henrik Dam, the Royal Danish Defense, Military, Naval, and Air Attaché. He has a distinguished career commanding at squadron and group levels, culminating with over five years as the commander of the Royal Danish Air Force. Next. I'd like to introduce Air Commodore Gary Martin, the Royal Australian Air Force attache. He's served as an air component and wing commander. He has more than 7,000 operational flying hours and oversaw the successful introduction of the C-17A Globemaster into the Royal Australian Air Force. And our third panelist today is Lieutenant Colonel Staff Pilot Hassan. United Arab Emirates Air Force and Air Defense. He's been hand-selected by the Armed Forces General Headquarters to participate in our panel. Lieutenant Colonel Hassan is an F-16 Block 60 pilot who has been commander of an F-16 training and operational squadron and is now an operations wing commander. So this panel today will highlight why we partner and how partnering impacts our current operational efforts. Specifically, we want to talk about how partnerships have contributed to this ongoing success that you heard General Carlisle talk about today, the operations that are ongoing in both Iraq and Syria against ISIL, also known as ISIS. But for our coalition, we call this inherent resolve. There are more than 60 coalition partners right now in this, in this operation. And in the air power, we want to talk about what we're doing. And these three partners that I have up here in the panel today, they're going to talk about th what they're doing as far as disrupting, degrading, and destroying ISIS. And what prepared them to get there and the successes that they have today. So again, these three partners that I just introduced you were fortunate, as I talked about the global partnerships that we have, that they represent three of our regions. And the format that I'm going to do today in this panel, my thought was that I have three questions that I'm going to ask each of them, three different questions I'm going to ask each of them. And then I want to leave some time, so if you're thinking about our, our uh, objective is today that we just want to tell you enough just to kind of whet your appetite to ask us a little bit more. Um, so that's what we're going to do, my intent to give you some time to ask your questions because that's really what we want to answer today. But I'm going to start first uh, with uh, General Dam. Uh, General Dam, Denmark has participated in numerous partner opportunities and coalition efforts such as multinational fighter program, NATO's Baltic Air Policing, and ISAF. Since Denmark is a key coalition partner fighting against ISIL, but also one of NATO's smallest air forces, how does participating in Operation Inherent Resolve impact Denmark's ability to meet its other long-standing international commitments? Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us here, and uh, thank you for, to AFA for setting up this magnificent event. 
Well, participating in international operations is a political choice. And as an Air Force, you have to obey by our political masters, and that's naturally what we will be doing. But talking about a small Air Force, we are talking about 30 UE's F-16 aircraft all in all. And when you deploy seven of these to international operations, it will have an impact. And you just have to make the prioritizations and the choices on the way and pray that you are doing it right. We'll never forget that prioritization is an opt-out exercise. And of course, when we are deployed abroad, you have to opt out on some of the other engagements that you were planning to do in a more peacetime environment. So what we have done to diminish the impact in the Danish Air Force is to keep our footprint as small as possible when we deploy. We've got seven aircraft deployed right now in a four plus three, four operation and three spares, and around 90 personnel, and that's it. This means that we can take up our national tasks, QRA tasks, and we can do uh, the training necessary to keep our operational level. But well, that's just about it. There's no room for additional tasks. So it has an impact, but there's no way around it, is there? Thank you. Thank you. So, Air Commodore Martin, Australia has presented quite a different force structure to Operation Inherent Resolve as compared to previous operations in the region. Can you discuss why this is the case? Certainly, Heidi. Um, what we've done on this particular operation, for the past 13 years, we've been deployed in the Middle Eastern area, mainly in the air transport realm, with our air mobility assets and our P3 overland ISR. And while those have been very successful, that was the stretch of where it was, C-17s, C-130Js, and the uh, uh, P-3s. But this, uh, over the last three years, we've actually reformed uh, in the structure and the delivery of aircraft and capability within our Air Force to enable us now to work with the uh, Super Hornets, a squadron has been stood up over the last four and a half years, and also our air-to-air -air refueling, and our wedge tail has come of uh, capacity, our E7. So after discussing the options with the government, once the ISIL threat had become pretty well known, and obviously some of the actions that had taken place on land in Australia as well, in our own uh, civil community, a decision was reached by the government to uh, set forth a deployment. And what we've done in this particular instance is in a uh, two-week period from notification, we had a, an entire package move out. Uh, this consisted of our E7, an air-to-air refueler, six Super Hornets, C-17, two C-130Js. This is now the second biggest single detachment that's operating there in the coalition uh, and empowering airstrikes uh, against ISIL. These aircraft are capable of operating as a package themselves, or as in the majority of tasking that's been conducted by the CAOC, they've been utilized as their primacy area. And in fact, we're now being resolved with the tanker, not only is it looking after all F-18, uh, A all the way through to G models, but we've actually married up eight, in, uh, eight other aircraft during this particular phase as well, so that we're able to operate with seven other nations. This is the sort of thing that the coalition brings together and what SAFIA has been able to empower us in that process with acquisitions and the knowledge of how to utilize these in that part. So Australia has in summary moved from very niche capabilities, a onesie twosie process, to now being able to deploy its fire force in one fell movement all on its own under its own steam. For us, this is a sizable uh, outcome and enables us to assist those far and close to us. Thanks. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Hassan, UAE has a long history of participating in expeditionary and coalition operations. UAE has continually upgraded its capabilities to include employing some of our most advanced systems, such as the F-16 Block 60, the most advanced F-16 in the world, as well as the C-17. With these types of advanced capabilities, how has UAE's role in coalitions evolved? Ms. Heidi, thank you for uh, the invitation, first of all, and I'm glad to be here. Now, uh, back to your question, yes, uh, the OE is playing a major role 
in U.S. and uh, coalition operations. And with this strong uh, and effective participation had allowed the UAE to become more integrated partner and more capable partner in terms of standards and other stuff. The, uh, I want to emphasize more also on uh, our participation right now in this operation. It was not the only operation that we have participated uh, in Syria, but also we have participated in the past in Somalia, Yemen, Libya, and Afghanistan. However, despite with all the many successes that we had, we want to move this level of uh, uh, partnership to the next level. We want to overcome uh, different issues that we're still having and still uh, putting on the table. We want to talk about the releasability issues that's still pending. We want to increase our combat effectiveness with more weapons or advanced weapons that we're looking for so we can uh, do our job in a better way. And I hope that uh, by helping us, we're helping the whole coalition forces. Thank you. Thank you. General Dan, so based on your experience, can you discuss the importance of tempering cultural, political differences when engaged in coalition operations? Is it possible for international Air Force culture to transcend national and regional cultures? In my experience, it is. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, during the Libyan campaign back in uh, uh, quite a few years ago, time is running very fast, we were based with our F-16s on Sigonella Air Base in, uh, on Sicily. And in came coalition partners from UAE, Sweden, France. We got uh, our good friends, Americans there, with some assets as well. And every time I went there, I saw how, not seamless, but how the spirit was there to help each other getting things done. It has been mentioned a couple of times today that nobody is worrying about the mission focus in the, in the Air Forces, not at least the American Air Force. But when it comes to the ground, they're all airmen, and they help each other. Getting solutions to problems that one of your partner nations have, and if you can help, you'll do that. And I think that is transcending all the way through Air Forces all over the world. And it is helped also, of course, by our participation in international exercises, red flag, US, in, in Nevada, and uh, in the future, maybe also in Alaska, has helped us a lot to get the same basis of professionalism. And I think this actually goes beyond cultural issues, except when we are talking about food, of course. <laughs> but, but that's another story. But when we are talking about getting the job done, I think that the Air Force way of doing things and actually the common basis we have uh, for Denmark's uh, Air Force, the Royal Danish Air Force, we have been training our pilots in the U.S. for years. And actually getting the network of actually meeting old friends when you get deployed somewhere else is a great help in actually solving all the problems. I don't see any cultural obstacles in getting the mission carried out. Thank you. Thanks, General Jim. I can tell you that's something I hear as I, I travel around and speak to many of the air chiefs where they just say, you know, there's no language barrier, there's no cultural barrier. Airmen understand airmen, and we just get it done together. So thank you for highlighting that. Air Commodore Martin, what, what has Australia seen as being different in its planning and operations for Operation Inherent Resolve as compared to previous coalition efforts? Well, that's uh, certainly been a rapid growing up. Australia had been uh, stuck between the Vietnam-Korean War and a lot of practices up into the uh, 1999. Uh, East Timor uh, broke out then, and suddenly we were deployed Air Force, and we've been deployed ever since. 
But I guess the feedback that we're getting in this particular instance uh, for us as Operation Okra with our forces is the actual work within the CAOC, as we were talking about C2 in the next few years, has already started to take that massive leap. Uh, there's always been this community of those that are close to the US, the Five Eyes Brigade, and further out there. But in this particular coalition, our experience is that the data release, the availability of information to get out there and do the task, has been put down to a single system that has taken a lot of learning lessons out of Afghanistan and been put forward in rapid agility. What that's allowed is when we look at the nations that have actually put forward in this particular coalition, being able to do that interoperability and talk to each other on a day-to-day -day basis about getting that mission done and using that sheer professionalism that all of our airmen have has actually been uh, absorbed that much quicker. Our Super Hornets, as I said, are a brand new squadron. This is the first time that they've been out of the country and we've only owned them for four years. That's a very rapid progression from a Super Hornet Classic into a two-seater, and the only other one that we had as a two-seater before that was the F111 which we'd already uh, put to bed for the last four years. So to be able to take that inexperience, put it in with the coalition work that we've been doing and getting information on how to operate these aircraft at the best levels, and then to integrate that into a dynamic success within an actual warfoot area, which is full of threats that are out there. Make no way about it. This is not a simple objective for our airmen to actually do the, do the mission task on a day-by-day -day basis. But they're able to get out there and hurt that, work with that ATO and be successful every time. If I put it on the uh, sustainment side for our tankers and the E-7, our particular E-7 went out on its first mission day as the reserve aircraft. They'd been in the uh, area for six days, getting acclimatized to what was going on and the other nations that were working together. Uh, second hour onto the mission, one of the other aircraft had a technical uh, issue and had to return back, and they got thrust into being the lead C2 aircraft of the place. Again, this is with relatively junior people in the back of the aircraft that have had about six to seven years of bringing this capability up from nothing to where it is now. Uh, they then did 12 and a half hours on station. No break, full out there, working with 16 different other involved nations in the air picture and bringing it into a very, very good sequence. And this is right in the, part, the beginning part of the operation. Our tanker has been out there since the uh, second week and, uh, of November and has done a sortie every single day, averaging 14 and a half hours on mission and has had no mission failures, not once. Okay, so again, that drive and determination of our airmen both from the RAF and all the other nations we're working with are ensuring that those aircraft get out there to do the mission and go out there every day. That involvement at that greater depth level has now been the biggest difference we've seen as Australia's been able to put forward a solid footstep and work with the coalitions. Thank you for that. Lieutenant Colonel Hassan, the UAE has made tremendous strides with your Air Warfare Center and Integrated Air and Missile Defense Center to develop regionally focused, multilateral capabilities that'll be critical to future security across the region and beyond. In this way, UAE is demonstrating crucial leadership in shaping the future of coalitions. What do you see as the benefits of hosting these leadership and coalition training programs? The AWC for UAE, it's actually a big success story for us. And also, what we did, I mean, like we had a big, uh, tremendous uh, progress, actually, in bringing all the coalition forces, especially the, uh, the coalition that is in the region. And uh, what we did, that we integrated all of them uh, into uh, practicing and exercising uh, during the flights. And uh, the UAE actually, um, I would consider that the UAE's uh, AWC also, uh, being in UAE, we were really fortunate to have uh, some of the best airspace that is available for us and the ranges. And also we have the state of arts of instrument uh, uh, tracking instrumentations and also one of the best uh, in the region uh, for the debriefing facilities. So having all this stuff, uh, bringing all the coalitions together, 
so uh, we think that we are leading nation in the region right now uh, to put all the, uh, not only the, uh, the uh, coalition forces uh, that's in the region, also the Western coalition that coming into uh, a big play. Now for the uh, integrated air missile defense system, also becoming uh, quickly one of the forum, uh, prime forum for us uh, in the region as being the uh, best training facility in the region. Um, unlike the AWC, the uh, Air Missile uh, Defense uh, Center is lacking a lot of tools that we need to uh, take it to the next level. And for the coalition forces, they need to uh, put a lot of effort in this term, and I'm talking about uh, shared pictures that we're not getting into this uh, organization and shared uh, early warning capabilities also that's missing. So uh, we need to focus more as a coalition partner uh, to put this effort because uh, uh, I would think it's not only going to help the UAE but it also is going to help all the uh, coalition forces in the region. Thank you. Thank you. General Dan, Denmark has been a longtime participant in mutual training as well as our military personnel exchange program to help build mutual understanding, enhance interoperability, and strengthen air force to air force ties. How do you feel participating in programs like this enhances the ability to perform coalition operations? We talk a lot about plug and play capabilities. And I think the key to plug and play in coalition, in coalition efforts is actually that we have trained together. We have been exchanging pilots and maintenance crews together. We have worked together in different ways. And we look forward to uh, every time we send people to the United States to participate in, in both training and exercises. And I think SAFIA have done a huge effort to make this happen. Without this training and these exchange programs, we wouldn't be able to plug in and actually getting the job done. So for me, the international cooperation, both in training exercises, but also when actually carrying out operations, is, is, a, is a, the prerequisite actually to make air power work in a coalition context. And to be honest, no one, even the US, uh, has troubles doing it all by themselves. And uh, we need to rely on each other to get the jobs done all over the world. And I think we can if the training and exercising is right. Thank you. Air Commodore Mort Martin, Australia has a proud tradition of working with the United States on military operations since World War I. How does your military view the progress of planning for coalition operations in the Pacific region? Well, that uh, certainly took a uh, large step when the uh, president made his uh, uh, swing towards the Pacific uh, speech. And uh, that postulated quite a few differences for Australia now being able to uh, take up its step and go beyond just being a, a small partner. Whilst we have a, a level of influence within Asia, the Asian community is uh, diverse. As uh, PACAF was saying earlier today, you know, this represents almost 60% of the world's population and a lot of water that sits between it. So being able to work in a diversified economic zone that's highly reliant upon trade with various nations, including China and up to the north, while still carrying out a Western-based uh, uh, defense relationship with America and uh, New Zealand as our primary partners down in that particular area, was uh, an interesting walk to take for both ourselves and our politicians. It's not a strange one. We've been doing it all of our lives down there. But we're getting more and more interrelated. So the way that we've been doing this over the past couple of the years is that we're uh, working with defense through Asia and with Asia. You know, we sit right at the bottom down there with New Zealand and we sort of look up at the globe towards the Northern Hemisphere. 
We look at our trade areas considerably coming through the Malacca Straits, South China Seas, and uh, moving across the, out of the uh, Middle East region as well. So we've been then working with each and every one of our uh, nations to the north of us at working out what exercises we can get into with them. Uh, they relate not only in flying exercises, but also taking across our air safety experts and working with them in uh, harmonizing the airworthiness processes that are looking after all our different platforms. This relies, this then gives us another level of cooperation and understanding between our nations so that when we're flying together, operating on the ground, commonality of spares, technical practices, the ways that we brief and debrief our missions, those systems that we utilize in the CAOX, now we all start to speak the same language. So this has boded uh, well and truly beyond just being neighbors and seeing each other at an air show, uh, but actually integrating ourselves into each other's communities and understanding those deep down roots that have formed the region's uh, air forces and the capabilities. And what you're seeing in Asia recently is a large step up in its uh, financial uh, abilities to possess the latest weapons. Uh, and everyone's been very close to the United States. But there's also been a lot of sales in from Russia and China as well. So again, being able to harmonize our understanding of what is a threat, what is just nations that are expanding at this particular stage, and being able to understand that and spread that understanding to our different coalition partners so that people's uh, steps heading towards the future expansion of their own countries and national interests isn't misread or miscommunicated so that uh, we land up in arguments that we actually shouldn't be having at that particular stage. A complex environment, but one that I think uh, we're starting to get a little bit more mature in ourselves and be able, able to assist at the right levels. Thank you. And then the last question that I have is for Lieutenant Colonel Hassan. Your, your country spent the last decade training with the Air Force and participating in multinational exercises such as AMC Rodeo and Red Flag. How do you feel that participation in these and other activities with the U.S. Air Force has impacted UE's combat effectiveness and its ability to successfully integrate into coalition operations? Well, the UAE gains a lot uh, during these exercises, and we gained a lot of experience and expertise, uh, especially uh, practicing and exercising in realistic training environment. It not only allowed us uh, for UAE to test our jets, but also our men and women's uh, flying skill, and also allowed us also to set the standards for the next future training, uh, whether it's for local training or with uh, working with our allies. But as many of you are aware, it's not only about flying in uh, these exercises. The primary challenge was to ensure the support functions that needs to be also prepared and trained and to be tested also. So what we need from our partners today for the future exercises that we need to concentrate on training onto the support uh, aspects of the uh, missions. And what I mean by that is uh, we need to concentrate on intel, maintenance, weapons, logistics, and it needs to be treated equally like we treat the flying part. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So it looks like we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and I've got some great questions here, but I think the, the biggest uh, feedback that I'm getting uh, from all of you is you want to hear a little bit more about command and control from the panel, that uh, NATO has one type of command and control system, and then there's other countries have different systems, and, uh, and so I'm getting a lot of questions on redundancy of command and control, interoperability, so that's what I'm going to have each panel member talk a little bit about. Uh, command and control, and uh, what you think is working, maybe, and if there's areas that you think we need to make some improvements. Coming from a very small NATO nation, it's hard to see where there's not a, a solid ground for improvements. Um, of course, there's a lot of different systems up and running. 
And uh, the integration of command control system has proven to be a very, very difficult exercise over the many, many years. And um, in most of the coalitions we have participated in, we have reverted to actually putting in some American CIA systems and actually learned to use them in order to get the information we need. I think some of the uh, great advantages ahead of us is actually that that the protocols and, uh, and the, the basis for C2 is getting more and more broad. The X system now entering service in, in, in NATO uh, is actually able to talk to uh, just about any other system uh, around. And, and we need these black boxes in order to do our command control. The other essential thing with command control is actually to get the liaison officers in and not only as liaison officers, but also some as embedded staff officers in the planning cycle and actually getting everything up running that way around so we can get the information out to the doers out in the sharp end of the system. But there's a lot to do still in the C2 world, and we heard this morning also that it's, it's a eternally developing area, I think, and it need to be. Certainly uh, operating in the region where we are, if I just take, uh, just for background so you understand where most of our C2 training is effectively occurs, uh, we have a centralized uh, joint headquarters in Bungendore, which is just outside Canberra. They run the entire air, ground and sea picture for all of our operations. So all of our force element groups, our wings and groups, formulate the raise, train, sustain plans, utilizing the exercises that we uh, get involved in. We then hand those forces over to our uh, Chief of Defense Force and the, uh, our uh, Joint Operations Center, JOC, for deployment and then uh, use and operations. They then get their C2 backwards and forwards from that particular point. So if you talk about tyranny of distance, Australia's getting pretty used to it in that realm. But our nearest neighbor when it comes to actually understanding and integrating that command and control is with PACAF. Uh, we have now uh, integrated our air picture that's uh, brought in from our joint over the horizon uh, uh, radar environment. Our own air picture as we're doing our Blue Force trackers and motions of our own air assets and now also our sea and ground assets. And that's able to be transmitted straight across to the nation, across to uh, Hawaii and uh, be put into the air picture and ground pictures uh, that they utilize. And this has now become a two-way communication because we are now actually seeing their aircraft and what they're doing as well. Why? Well, flying around the Pacific, there's a lot of island nations out there that have several boxes, people, personnel, weapons, and equipment that need to be moved around. We've all got a lower level of assets around the place, and certainly having aircraft flying around empty would be a, a, the one thing that our politicians do not want to see us doing. So we're now able to integrate that tasking and look at different nations to be able to assist them moving around their gear and the same for us. As such, we may have aircraft landing and picking up a Filipino uh, army group or moving some of their air force equipment and vice versa. So if you sort of think of us as a uh, a large uh, movements corporation in the air mobility area, this is now starting to take effect. And that picture is absolutely required as we head forward with our air-to-air -air refueling tanking capability. The ability uh, for the US forces to fly over and around Asia and marry up with an Australian uh, tanker is seen to us to be, it should just be happening. It's not a matter of what tail flashes appear on that tanker. All that the crews are looking for is fuel at a certain time at a certain place so they can do their job. This is certainly one of those big benefits that we're seeing for ourselves. But further to that, we actually uh, take a uh, revolving realm with the KOC sitting across in uh, Udeed, so that we uh, actually have a third commander there. Every third rotation is actually filled by an Australian uh, one-star and then two-star when the need requires. So again, with only an Air Force size of 14,500 people, uh, a little bit uh, bigger than some of our European nations, but comparable to the normal other sized air forces, we tend to get around and being seen in a lot of places. So most of you will have bumped against an Aussie somewhere who uh, you'll remember by name and uh, capitulation and probably some bad tales. Uh, but we're out there doing it. And this is again as we move from that niche to understand where those command and control areas are. 
With the UAE, we've been integrating in there as well to understand exactly as they step up and uh, become a, a more powerful nation uh, with that whole command and control network and training system that they've got there, because our ba main base has been in Minhad, as I said, for now 10 years. You know, we're not there just to stay for an overnight. We're there for the long haul. And that's quite clear why, uh, via what our political statements have been as a nation as well. Thank you. I don't want to sound here negative in a way, but it seems like it, yeah? Um, the UAE Air Force is really a young Air Force. We do have our own command uh, and control centers. But we learned a lot in the last decade, working closely with our allies. But again, I want to emphasize more, and just like the Air Commodore Gary uh, Martin said, it's a key word here, having the big picture. Now working by our own selves, we're gonna have just a small picture of the bigger, uh, bigger picture. And we wanna change that. Right now, just like I mentioned before, we're missing different parts of the pictures because there's a lot of certain areas that it's affecting us because of the realizability issues. And we need to have that trust between us. And just like uh, my colleagues here sitting talking about the uh, pictures, we wanna share these pictures. The UAE today is willing to share that picture and we want these pictures from your side too. And I hope um, the future is gonna be brighter than this. And I hope we can work together and just to help us, we will help you too. So thank you. Thank you for that. Another question, I'll open it up uh, to any of you, is how do coalitions better integrate national forces with varying capabilities and varying force sizes? And you know, one of the things that came to my mind on this is how we've done uh, the consortium and Papa Hungary for countries that otherwise couldn't afford a C-17 on their own. So there's three, seven, three C-17s being operated at Papa Hungary with 12 nations, uh, all having access to that capability, participating together. But you may have some other ideas of uh, that there's something for everyone. Well, uh, there has to be, I suppose, as we look forward and where our numbers are and uh, the value of the finances that's coming in in the future years. Um, in Asia, we're doing uh, quite a lot of that strategic uh, work with the government levels, as I said, to understand where different weaknesses or strengths are in our particular defense forces and all aspects of the defense force. Uh, getting around and doing uh, guardian angel uh, missions where we're going into island nations and assisting with their health with our ships, taking on board doctors and working in that area is definitely one of those sort of areas that we get to understand what the local conditions are. We've been able to spread ourselves amongst the different uh, areas so that we can pick up and assist in that area has definitely come about in our humanitarian assistance and disaster relief design. Um, here we actually integrate our Air Force as the carriage item to get our national assets out there. So our main aid packages come out of our state governments within Australia. The Air Force is then utilized along with our shipping area from the uh, Navy to actually get that aid package out at the right time at the right place under a federal alignment process of the nations that we are, are working with. So a trifecta situation. Uh, this was definitely brought out as we saw with the uh, tsunami in Japan where we landed up with our entire C-17 fleet at that stage, all four aircraft. Uh, one was uh, in the service repair, rapidly being dragged out, and the other three were all deployed and stayed in Japan, even with the nuclear threat, which for us was quite substantial because we never even uh, uh, looked at that in the initial stages. What happened if we got caught in nuclear dirty air whilst carrying around the Japanese self-defense force and conducting the aid around there? So I guess what it's actually done is actually stretched our imagination as an Air Force that we're not here just to do a mission, but we're here to do various aspects of those same missions. 
the ability to do to transcend distance and uh, time with the various aircraft like the C-17 and go international at a moment's notice has now allowed a freedom of effort for the Australian government to actually look and say, we can be there, we can have a meeting tonight, we can deploy, get in a word to the Air Force, and they can be deployed in about eight hours that next day and make an effect by 6 p.m. On, in Australia Day. Um, that's a sizable contribution that we can now do in that part there, and it's how we've been able to assist other nations around us to uh, share in any pain that they've been in and get them out of harm's way as fast as possible. Well, I think we need to realize that diversity in a coalition is actually a strength. It's not the same threats that uh, our adver adversaries are facing, and uh, there are different ways of coping with things. But getting everything up running together, uh, I can't help but pointing towards the smart defense initiative actually running uh, in NATO, where you actually try to pool and share some of the more expensive assets that you can uh, bring to bear in, in an air power campaign. Especially when we are talking about precision guided munitions and, and other stuff that is, is hard to get with a long lead time. I think it makes a lot of sense actually to do some more pooling and sharing and the Smart Defense Initiative is, is a good vehicle for that. Also, I would like to point out some of the the other programs uh, with a significant U.S. lead, the multinational fighter program concerning the F-16s, for instance, where we have a, a European branch called the European, the European Partner Nations um, that has actually kept our quite old 34 years plus, no, sorry, 33 years plus. That was a 10 years that does slip my mind. Um, 33 years old aircraft up to date and actually fully capable of doing combat missions today. And that is because of these multinational programs with a distinct lead and a big brother that can actually help all the small nations getting what they actually need to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the last question. And so as a wrap up, again, I wanna thank the panelists and uh, hopefully your takeaway from this is it's taken decades of some great programs out there where we do airmen to airmen programs, both in professional development and in our training and exercises, and the great equipment uh, that we, our industry uh, has made exportable to our coalition partners that allows this interoperability and that continued exercising together in advance of the next humanitarian disaster, in advance of the next conflict is what's important. Uh, so we're proud of our coalition, we're part of, proud of our interoperability, and we'll continue these programs in the f future uh, to continue this success.